why would you want to go back and look at the data your model is training? So in industry, there are real compliance reasons. So, you know, if you're in the EU, a lot of our customers will get data from their users, but then the users have the right to take their data out of the same right. range. Yeah, a great use case for weights and biases is that we can produce the data that your model was trained on. I think the US regulations right now are not clear enough to know exactly what you should produce. And so I worry a little bit, I worry a lot, honestly, that the US regulations were just vague and scary. AI might be the most important new computer technology ever. It's storming every industry and literally billions of dollars are being invested. So buckle up. The problem is that AI needs a lot of speed and processing power. So how do you compete without costs spiraling out of control? It's time to upgrade to the next generation of the cloud, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, or OCI. OCI is a single platform for your infrastructure, database, application development, and AI needs. OCI has four to eight times the bandwidth of other clouds, offers one consistent price instead of variable regional pricing, and of course, nobody does data better than Oracle. So now you can train your AI models at twice the speed and less than half the cost of other clouds. If you want to do more and spend less, like Uber, 8x8, and Databricks Mosaic, take a free test drive of OCI at oracle.com slash ionai. That's E-Y-E-O-N-A-I all run together. Oracle.com slash ionai. That's oracle.com slash ionai. Hi, I'm Craig Smith. And this is I on AI. In this episode, I talked to Lucas Bewald, co-founder of Weights and Biases, a company at the forefront of ML ops with innovative tools designed to streamline the machine learning workflow. Lucas talks about some of the under the hood complexities that his company addresses, from tracking changes in training data to monitoring large model behavior in production. I hope you find the conversation as informative as I did. Okay, so why don't you start, Lucas, by introducing yourself, giving some of your background, uh, where you went to school, uh, what you were doing before Weights and Biases, and uh, how you came to start the company. And then we'll talk about what the company does and uh, and talk more generally about uh, neural nets and large language models and where the research is going. Sure, sure. Um, so I was a Stanford undergrad and then a master's student where I expected to get a PhD and was doing research with Daphne Kohler, um, you know, back in 2004, 2005, um, and did work on natural language processing, which I think is all probably irrelevant at this point, but yeah. working on translation and kind of support vector machines and, and Bayes nets and kind of older models. And from there, I went to work on search at Yahoo and then search at a NLP startup called PowerSet that actually became Microsoft Bing. Yeah. And through that process, through actually all three of those um, stints that I did working on natural language, got convinced that the most important problem in machine learning was access to high quality training data. Yeah. So I started a company called Crowdflower yeah. that uh, rebranded as um, Figure 8 towards the end. It was a kind of early version of Scale AI. And we collected data sets for almost everyone doing natural language processing back then. And then um, image uh, processing kind of came online with, with you know, kind of modern methods and convolutional neural networks. And you know, what, what year was Crowdflower? <laughs> Crowdflower was probably started, I think it was 2007. Oh. Um, you know, back then, actually, you know, machine learning was not hot. You know, investors did not want to hear the word machine learning. It was a really different time. And we ran, I think, until 2018 or 2019 when it sold to Appen, which is a big public um, company in Australia that no one's ever heard of, <laughs> but, you know, did quite a lot of um, natural language processing. And from there, I started a company, Weights and Biases, with the idea being we wanted to help with the rest of the tool chain in machine learning. So we'd gotten training data for thousands of companies and teams and researchers. And we started to see lots of new problems with getting those models into production and making them useful. And we wanted to help with the end-to-end -end solution. 
uh, versus just the training data problem. I think training data now, there's lots of ways to do it, but still there's many issues making machine learning actually really work for real yeah. applications. Uh, just going back, Daphne Color, I've had her on the podcast uh, talking about her drug discovery, yeah. uh, uh, but also about her career. And uh, I've had Fei-Fei Li on talking about the creation of ImageNet mm -hmm. and then what, what she's working on. Yeah. Uh, so your Crowdflare was prior to ImageNet? In fact, I remember Fei-Fei Li reached out and asked me if I could help her um, you know, do ImageNet. And I really, really regret not doing it. <laughs> At the time, you know, it was like we were really trying to make money and academics are such horrible customers that she had all these specific requirements. So yeah. I remember turning her down, but um, I, I regret that to this day. I think ImageNet was such an amazing contribution. I'm just curious, how did Crowdflower uh, aggregate data. I mean, the word crowd makes me think it's like yeah. Mechanical Turk or something. Yeah, so at that time, I mean, Mechanical Turk was kind of starting to become popular. And, you know, the real challenge was that getting high quality data was the biggest issue. So at first, we were an aggregator on top of Mechanical Turk. But then as we kind of moved into more industrial applications, we started crowdsourcing people all over the world. So we kind of became our own. Um, Mechanical Turk in a way, but more oriented towards large scale industrial data collection and and text textual data. Well, it started with text, and that was the big thing at the time, right? So the applications back then, our big customers were the big search companies, and then e commerce, you know, wanted search. So at that time, those were the big applications, and and also text extraction for financial companies like you know Bloomberg and banks and others. Um, but then over time, as image applications started working we saw an explosion in image labeling. So, you know, by the end, image labeling had overtaken um, text. And now with my new company, we see the opposite trend where it started off, it was mostly vision applications. And, and I think text has actually come back and, and overtaken vision, at least from what we see on our new platform at Weights and Masses. Yeah, uh, yeah I've, I've worked with a label box mm -hmm. and, uh, and I know, uh, is it Alex Ratner at scale? Mm -hmm. And I've talked to some of the other uh, uh, snorkel. No, Alex is at snorkel. Yeah, yeah. right. Uh, and um, is that business uh, still strong? I was surprised here at the conference to see people talking about annotation. Uh, is is annotated data still given the the self supervised learning? explosion is annotated data still as important as it was yeah it's a huge huge business still it's evolved so um you know i i, I know all these guys and you know talk to them a fair amount um i think you see less vendors here than at cvpr or more vision oriented right. conference i think in vision it's still um really unsolved problem and now there's a lot of tooling to help the annotators be more efficient more yeah. effective and in, in text, what I hear is that you need more and more high quality annotation. So it used to be very, very simple um, annotation that you could almost do in a, in a blink of an eye, like instant you know, feedback from humans. And now sometimes the type of labeling they're doing takes hours. But I think RHLF is booming. I mean, it's yeah. absolutely here. Well, here to stay is a dangerous thing to say in this industry, but I think that it's not going anywhere anytime soon. And the demand is only increasing. This Although I've been talking to people uh, about RL, RLAIF, which, you know, sounds like it may overtake RLHF. RLHF to me sounds, I mean, for listeners that don't know what it is, it's reinforcement learning with human feedback. And it's being heavily used by the large model companies to kind of nudge the models away from hallucination or other bad behavior, but uh, to, to just intuitively, that sounds like a very crude way to go about it. But uh, what, do, what do you think is when you say it's here to stay, that's, that surprises me. It sounds to me like a very short term solution. Interesting. Well, I'm, I'm not an expert on this anymore. So this is, um, this is not my, my area at this point, but I guess I would say broadly that as long as humans can do things better than um, AI algorithms, I think 
inputting that human data in some form is is valuable. I think yeah. as AI gets more sophisticated, you know, you continue to automate away various tasks that humans used to do because it's painful and expensive to get humans involved. So I think that the tasks become more sophisticated and complicated and specific that humans are doing. But my feeling is that um, until we hit singularity or whatever you want to call it, why not have human input to make the algorithms better? Yeah. And, and we'll get to weights and biases. I'm sorry, but this, this is, and I know this is a previous slide for you, uh, but it's interesting to me. Uh, annotating text, uh, just, I've never quite, I've never looked into it, so I don't really know what people mean by annotating text. Are you talking about uh, annotative sort of identifying, you know, subject, verb, uh, or are you talking about uh, larger concepts or what, yeah, what, what are you annotating when you annotate text? Um, all kinds of things. I mean, it's changed over time. So, you know, the big applications used to be, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, it would be, um, something like text extraction, right? Where like, you know, I have this document, maybe it's a medical record. I want to pull out the name of the person. I want to pull out, you know, what diseases maybe they have. Maybe I want to like put that in some ontology that I have almost any unstructured document, there's some way that you want to structure it to feed it into a computer. And so it's literally having human beings do some of the tasks that you want the, uh, the algorithm to do, and then using that as, as training data. Yeah. So, so every NLP task you could think of would have an annotation component. Now, that's a little bit out of date, right? Now people use um, you know, large language models for quite a lot of tasks. Yeah. And so the annotations have changed, right? So now the things that people want is really high quality input for the algorithms, right? So if the algorithm is having trouble with reasoning, putting in really high quality reasoning, if the algorithm has trouble telling compelling stories, okay, you want someone to input compelling stories. If the algorithm is, you know, saying things that are rude, you want to guide it to saying things that are not rude, right? And so um, that's the, the sort of modern type of annotation. Yeah. Uh, okay. So on to weights and biases uh, and and ML ops more generally. Uh, give us. Uh, I know what weights and biases are within a neural network, but explain what weights and biases are and why you chose that as the as the as the name of the company. Yeah. And so so weights and biases are kind of the, the coefficients, the numbers inside of a neural net. Right. So a neural net basically consists of weights and biases, and that's all the numbers inside. Um, you know, transform or any um, algorithm that, that you might use. And the name is like historical. I think it comes from linear regression where the coefficients are weights and then the final term um, was multiplied by one, right? So it's kind of a constant, it's called the bias. Yeah. And we called the company Weights and Biases because, you know, our, our thesis with Weights and Biases when we started it six years ago was we really want to be on the side of the ML practitioner, the researcher, or the engineer that's responsible for building the neural network. And we felt like the software that was available at the time was very clearly being sold to like the CIO or the CTO or some yeah. you know, kind of like high level boss who, you know, has like compliance requirements which are important, but he's was neglected. At the time, the software that was available <clears throat> was really clearly designed for um, CTOs, CIOs, um, folks like that. And we wanted to make software that really served the ML researchers themselves, the ML practitioners. And so we wanted a name that would show that, right? So we wanted, we, we still to this day have people come up to our booth, booth at every conference we go to, except NeurIPS, where they say, oh, weights and balances, what does that do? <laughs> and then they tell me what a dumb name, <laughs> you know, I, I made the company. But um, I kind of love it because I think that people that are in our, our target market they understand our name yeah. that's actually changing a little bit you know with um this evolution to llms and prompt engineering and all that but um yeah at this point the name is, is yeah. stuck yeah 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 and it's a tool of will you describe it yeah. sure sure i like to think of it as as a set of tools mm -hmm. that take care of the needs that you have from getting a model from first conception or, or like first spec out to deployed and doing something useful in production. And that's kind of our North Star is, okay, like what does the industry need to get these models running reliably in production? Like what do practitioners need to make their life easier? Um, is another way of saying 
So some of our like guiding principles are we try to integrate with everything, including competitive products. So like, um, you know, because again, I think if you had sort of like a top down MBA strategy, you might say, hey, let's like block out, you know, all the competitors. Like you just have to live in weights and devices world. For us, we know that people are like, using lots of different stuff already. And so we want to integrate, you know, into that. And we try to pick off pieces of the solution that we know we can do really well. So for example, things we don't do that I think are big problems is like ML infrastructure, right? Like everyone's GPUs. Every, our customers always come to us, hey, can you get me GPUs? We don't have GPUs. We can't help you with that, right? We can't, um, you know, we can't help you with low-level infrastructure stuff. We're just not good at that. And a lot of people are working on it. The problem is not solved. Um, but we can help you. And I think we do a really good job. Keep track of what's happening as you build your models. I think almost everyone at NeurIPS uses us for that these days. Things that people don't know we can do, but I think we do really well, is something called data lineage, where you want to know uh, what's upstream of your model. So usually, you're, often these days, your model is trained on a foundation model. Maybe that foundation model is actually fine-tuned on a different you know, foundation model. So we can keep track of that lineage for you. And we can keep track of all the data that goes in. And there might be like transforms of the data along that way, data augmentations. So we can keep track of that whole pipeline for you in an efficient way and keep track of all the evaluations that you do on your model. I mean, these days, yeah. people typically have like a fast set of evaluations and then slower evaluation sets that they might run asynchronously. And of course, these evaluation sets and these training data sets are always changing all the time. And so in a perfect world, they'd always be the same and everything would be organized and beautiful. But we want to help in the messy world that people actually work. Yeah. And you were showing me uh, the the interface yesterday. Uh, you Then you, you, you produce these visualizations, uh, for example, for evaluations where it's very easy to see, uh, you know, where things are doing better, where they're doing worse. Can, uh, talk about those visualizations and how, how people use them. And then we were talking about uh, integrating uh, sort of conversational uh, mm -hmm. models. Uh, I mean, my perspective is that we, we hardly ever do original research. We try to take the research and make it easy to use, right? So there's, I think there's like hundreds of papers out here in this yeah. conference on interesting visualizations. And we try to look at what it, what is real, like what are people really doing and, and using? And then we try to make it easy to surface those in our app, right? So like a simple loss curve is kind of table stakes, but, you know, we try to make it easy to, to generate that. And, you know, these days people have lots of different loss curves and the data gets high dimensional and then you want different, you know, visualizations there to try to see patterns and, higher dimensional data. Um, also, you would be shocked by how many of our customers have trouble producing an example of an image that they're labeling or producing the actual text, literally the text that was like fed into their system because it gets tokenized, all these weird things happen to it. And then, you know, if you're just looking at the number, that doesn't tell you what's really going on. So just surfacing literally, okay, what was this text here? And what's my LLM predict is like the next set of tokens in a way that you can read. I think in a way that's the most important thing that we do. Yeah, and that's for evaluation primarily? Evaluation, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, evaluation. Yeah, uh, and uh, yeah, because I, I was asking again yesterday um, why somebody would need to go back and, and track some of this stuff. Uh, and you were saying for all kinds of compliance reasons or... Uh, you know. Yeah. So why would you want to go back and look at the data your model is trained on? So in industry, there are real compliance reasons. So, you know, if you're in the EU, a lot of our customers will get data from their users, but then the users have the right to take their data out of the set, right. right? So, you know, we'll have a customer that's trained on a billion images minus three, right? And they have to be able to show that those three are out of their data set on the, that the model's trained on. And when there's fine tuning and like, you know, upstream models, as you'll really see in production, that actually is kind of a complicated thing to really prove that these three data points were removed from your set. That's like an industrial application, but in research, it's really important too, right? Like you know, it's very common, I think, for test data to leak into training data. These days, like I often wonder with some of these um, models performances on standard benchmarks, there's so many ways that it could potentially leak into, um, you know, what the model was trained on. I think it's just best practice. Like, I mean, even if no regulator is telling you to check um, what data your model is trained on, it'll make you more efficient to know, right? And and you could write it down. 
you know, it's like not, I'm not saying we're doing rocket science here. You can write it down once, you can write it down twice, but you know, the thousandth time you write it down, you might forget to do it or you might get it wrong. And so, or think, finding the 500th time exactly. out of a thousand. Yeah, right. yeah. 500th time. And I also think it, um, you know, these files get really big. And that also makes people a little bit lazy, right? Like, you know, like, you know, it's pretty frustrating, right? When you, you know, you have like, you know, a, like a petabyte file and then a few of those files change. So, like, having kind of an efficient way to version that, we built our own system because we didn't see a good system out there. We tried to use some of the open source stuff. Um, that I think works in different cases, but we really need felt our customers were asking us to design something for the case where files are so big they don't fit into a file system, uh, so it could live on like an object store. So that, that's that's those are some of the things that that we worked on to to make data lineage work. And I, I do think people don't really understand the significance of it until you get in a situation where you can't produce the, the training data of a, of a run that you had. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah, you talked about, uh, you know, excluding certain things from training data or taking them out. Yeah. Uh, that's something I've, I've heard people talking about, uh, uh, you know, forgetting how to how to teach a language model to forget something <laughs> that it's been trained on. Yeah. Uh, how do you I mean, I can understand uh, excluding uh, images from from you know a supervised learning model but from these large models that that internalize uh, the training data uh, is it possible to to take that out once the model's been trained and this is you know what what all these copyright cases are pointing to i think that's a research topic that I, i'm not 100 percent up to speed on but i would be suspicious of of anyone that says they can really make a model forget something. I mean, there's so many ways that it can, you know, kind of creep out. And we've seen so many ways to, to do that, that I would really recommend starting with a model that didn't have it in there. I mean, I think this one of my takeaways from this NeurIPS, though, and, and you know, kind of recent uh, discussions with folks is that there are so many great open source models coming out right now. And, you know, most of them are built on weights and biases, and most of them actually produce the weights and biases reports and lineages, the, the open source ones do. And so um, I think one service that we can offer is if you really want to go and dig in and see exactly the data that models were trained on, often there's a weights of biases report available that will show you. Yeah. Uh, you, uh, you mentioned the regulation in the EU. I mean, that's coming in the US. Uh, do you think that, that you guys are poised to be like one of the primary tools for compliance if if uh you know the regulation comes in and you have to produce uh, your training data set and show that there's no copyrighted material for example in the training data set or no synthetic data in the training data set or if that's something you're worried about yeah a great use case for weights and biases that we can produce the data that your model was trained on i think the u.s regulations right now are not clear enough to know exactly what you should produce. And so I worry a little bit, I worry a lot, honestly, that the U.S. regulations were just vague and scary and not prescriptive in terms of like what you could do to, to comply with it. So I wish we could say, hey, this is the report that'll make you in compliance. Right now, what I tell customers is these are the reports you could produce that are best practice. And there's no tension here. The, the stuff that you would want as a company to operate well is the same stuff I think that the government is going to eventually want. So um, right now we're just squarely on the side of what's useful for our customers. But I think that if the regulators are smart, that should be the same thing that they ask for. Yeah. Uh, you were also showing me uh, the um, tracking experiments, uh, which uh, I, I mentioned to you um, Determined AI, I, I did a podcast series with them a couple of years ago. I think they were bought by somebody. Uh, but they, we talked about tracking exper experiments and and why that's important. And yeah, the, the way I understood it is, you know, you're, you're sort of absorbed in all this stuff and you, you, you run a, 
a test and and it, you, you think oh you know i should tweak that and it'll be better and then you do that and then five times later you realize oh it was better back then but then you got to go and figure out what everything all the settings and everything is that is that what tracking experiments is for and and can you talk about how you guys do that and how you visualize it for users yeah I mean, again, I think tracking experiments is, is exactly what you said. I think anyone that's done machine learning realizes that unlike software, the, the key difference between doing machine learning and doing software is that in this non-deterministic world, you're really doing experiments, right? Like most of the stuff that you do is throwaway code, whereas most of the software there, right? It's throwaway code maybe because people don't use it, but it's not like, you know, it didn't actually produce the intended result. And so when you... Um, uh, you know, when you do all these experiments, your real IP is these experiments. Like it's things that you're like learning, right? If you're going to write a paper, that's like what you go back to, to figure out like what to put in that table. And a big thing for me, like when I was starting the company was like, you know, you look at these tables inside um, research papers and you just want more information. You know, it's like they have like limited like ink space, right? And so, you know, it's like, you know, that they collected more metrics, yeah. you know, that they tried more things and you really want to see all that. So for research purposes, I love it when people make their weights and biases experiments available so you can see like every single thing that they tried inside of um, companies what I always say is look if you're not tracking your experiments when somebody leaves their IP mostly walks out the door yeah. like you might have the model they produced in the end but that model is like a byproduct of a lot of learning and for yeah. someone to improve that model they're going to have to catch up yeah. on the on the previous work so yeah I think experiment tracking yeah uh, oh, and we talked um, mm -hmm. about you you said that you are s sort of researching or, or experimenting with uh, large language model uh, interface or, or layer. Uh, and there's so much being done in using uh, large models to analyze complex systems. Uh, is, is, could you have a, a, a model that rather than having a, a human sort of go through the, the archive or whatever you call it, of your experiments and sort of looking at what changed and and uh, uh, that sort of thing. Could you have a large model sort of flash through all that and say, oh, you know, the, the, the your, your, your best uh, performance came from this model because you had this, I mean, <laughs> I'm obviously not a yeah. machine learning engineer, but, but yeah. Yeah, potentially. I mean, in a way, you know, hyperparameter sweeps are like sort of like a simple mathy, you know, version of that. But I do think that today, uh, one key part of being a machine learning engineer is researching what's going on in your models. And so I, I think like outsourcing that completely to an LLM is probably dangerous because, you know, that that is like your job, right? So, so you're really automating away this core, um, you know, thing that you're doing, which, you know, it, it could be effective. But I don't think that the models are good enough today to do that. But certainly we're experimenting with um, ways to do that. Yeah. Uh, so as a company, uh, you, you built these uh, products. How is it evolving? I mean, are you uh, adapting the products as uh, the research evolves so that the, they, they can fit more closely with what people are doing? Or are you creating new products well it's evolving in that i think the biggest effect there's two big things happening right so so one major thing is that this conference neurops used to be totally research right there really were not applications there are not a lot of companies coming here now you see tons of executives coming here and the reason is that this research is just incredibly applicable to so many applications like you would just not believe how many industries are, are touched by this today so most big companies at this point have a machine learning team that's trying to get models into production. And so that, you know, makes us, you know, maybe orient a little bit more towards compliance, a little bit more towards high scale development, a little bit more towards things like monitoring in production, you know, because because research is sort of just get the paper out. And yeah. I, I'm actually, what I'm passionate about is actually making these things work. So I love, you know, working with like you know, Procter & Gamble to make the medicine taste better or, you know, working with like a farming company to make sure that, you know, they're using less pesticides because they can see exactly where the weeds are. I mean, I love these applications. I get really excited about it. 
Um, and so, you know, as you go into bigger businesses, you know, you get more complicated security controls and, and all these things, right, that, that companies yeah. care about. That's one big effect. And that's, you know, been an evolution of our business. The other thing is more like a shock, which is that um, the way people do machine learning has changed a lot in the last year or two, because now many things can be done with what they call prompt engineering. Yeah. Right? And I think at this point, it's like a little bit of fine tuning and prompt engineering, a little bit of agents, you know. Yeah. But that's like a really new workflow, still experimental. But what is the unit of experiment when you're trying to build an agent? I think it's actually a little different than, than modeling. So that's a place where we've been kind of rapidly updating our software to, um, you know, accommodate these cool new use cases. So yeah. those are the two big things. And and uh, on prompt and en- engineering, does does each time you tweak the prompt count as an experiment? Well, it's a good question, but yeah, I think it does. I mean, I think your your model essentially with these prompts is yeah, each time you tweak the prompt. But in the real world, people don't usually use one prompt; it's like multiple prompts chained together, or an agent that's even like automatically you know creating yeah. prompts depending on what the results are. So, what's an experiment is a complicated question. What's a model even? Is a complicated question in this world. But from Wade's and Bias's point of view, if if someone is is running different prompts uh, to try and get a certain result, you're you're uh, tracking that and and yeah, we track it in the same. Yeah, and you mentioned monitoring. Uh, so so Wade's and Bias's uh, is it attached? to uh, different models or do you do you run it kind of in the background uh and and for monitoring and i'd, I'd like to hear a little bit about why monitoring is important again i know on a, on a high level why uh, but i don't i've never really understood why model drift happens and things like that yeah. uh is 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 the product something that's embedded then in in uh, in a model or or in a productized model so that it's always monitoring performance and that sort of thing? Yeah. So the way it works is you, you instrument your code with a few lines of weights and biases code. So you import a library into the code that runs your model or trains your model. And then what happens is that model is saving data locally on your computer and, and files right? Because we never want to crash your training or your model running, right? So file system is very stable, right? So we really, we're saving everything, like caching it locally. But the amount that you're monitoring often is bigger than a file system can handle. So in the background, it's also streaming that to a central server. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for most academic use cases, they use, you know, Adobe Beta AI that you can just log into. Simple, right? Everyone can go to our website, you know, and, and, um, and see what's going on. Um, many companies want to run, you know, in their own kind of private VPN. So then they have their own URL, uh, where the stuff is, is streaming to. And you ask about like, well, why does, um, data drift happen? <laughs> and I actually think data drift is fun for academics to talk about. I think in the real world, the problems are even more basic, but you see them all the time. And it's because models are very sensitive to inputs. And inputs can change in a a lot of ways that would be surprising, right? So, you know, models are typically trained on data inputs or upstream of them. And, you know, if if something just switches where, like, all the output is zero, you typically don't... The the, the problem with models is they don't give you, like, an error message or warning, typically. They just start behaving weird. And so I think that in the real world, the most common source of, you know, problems in production is something upstream changed right even a lot of times models are trained on upstream models that's really common like you know when i worked even like you know 20 years ago at yahoo we had a search ranking algorithm it's like okay is this re- web page relevant to this query you know and try to test that and then we figured out okay we also have this team that's working on spam because there's spammy websites trying to sell you a bunch of junk and it turned out okay that spam score is useful to know if something's relevant even if it's not like marked as spam if it's like a little yeah. spammy that's relevant so one day, the spam team updates their model, right? They make it better. <laughs> and then, boom, <laughs> you know, suddenly these spam scores are, like, higher than they used to be. And our model silently freaks out and thinks that all these results are spammy and the ranking goes haywire. And it's nothing to do with the ranking model that we had. It just was sensitive to that. And the spam team didn't know that we were consumers of that. 
that happens all the time in production, like every day, right? And so um, that's that's kind of one failure mode, but it's often, almost always, kind of human error versus these sort of more sophisticated things that um, academics like to study. But it is true that language does change more than we realize over time. And, you know, like a few years ago, there'd be a lot less emojis in a typical text corpus. And I think our eyes just sort of scan over that and we don't really notice the emojis. But I think from a computer's perspective, might be like, what is going on here? You know what I mean? There's all these new characters that I've never been trained on, haven't seen before. And, and you know, new slang can freak things out. I don't know if like LMs are more robust to it, but I sort of suspect not. I think our brains are just so good at like synthesizing kind of new information and adapting to it. And remember, these models are typically static, right? I mean, they almost never... Um, you know, retrain themselves. So that can be counterintuitive, I think, to, to downstream users. Yeah, that's interesting. And and so on the monitoring side, what are you monitoring? Monitoring. I mean, basic stuff, right? Just like, you know, is it is it producing a similar output distribution to what it had in the past? Like sometimes, you know, smart companies will have like a test set that they just keep running, you know, the model on, just make sure like it keeps, you know, working at a certain level. Also making sure that the input data you know, isn't doing something weird. Again, there's so many different cases that, you know, weights and biases tends to not have a super strong point of view on how to do things. Like we'll sort of suggest like, here's what we think are best practices and try to make the common paths easier for you. But the truth is that I think everyone in different applications should be doing monitoring differently. Like different kinds of errors are different levels of bad. I mean, it's even kind of a complicated question, you know, for autonomous vehicle company, like, you know, mistaking like a bicyclist versus mistaking a dog versus a baby carriage versus a sidewalk. You know, we probably have an intuitive ranking of like, you know, how we think about those errors, but it, you have to ultimately kind of put that in a loss function and put coefficients against how much pain yeah. you want to assign to each one. That's tough to do. Yeah. So mm-hmm. the, the monitoring uh, function of weights and biases, is that a separate model? You, you were saying that you have a kind of a suite of products. Mm-hmm. So is there like a monitoring product yeah. and, and, and how t- is it all bundled or, or do people pick and choose what they want? And then how are they, uh, is it a subscription model? Or, yeah. So it's a subscription model. We give a lot of way free to academics. Um, so most academics don't pay us. So you have to really be hammering our uh, servers before, you know, you get into a state where we, we charge academics, but some do. So, you know. Occasionally that happens. Um, we, you know, today we have a model where we charge um, on a bundle. We charge for the whole bundle and we say, you know, you can pick and choose what parts are useful to you because it's so painful to sort of like gate people against the paywall each time they want to add yeah. more and more functionality. But, you know, that could change. I mean, we just try to match our pricing as best we can to the value that we're providing for companies. Yeah. And on the monitoring uh, specifically, uh, so you you suggest these different ways to monitor or different things to monitor, and then the user tailors it to their model, or or does your does yeah. weights and biases sort of look at the problem and and decide how to monitor the no, model? No. It's super simple. I mean, when I say suggest things to monitor, I mean like literally in our documentation, we have suggestions on how to hook things up. So you're basically setting this up, doing the logging. You know, setting up alerts or graphs based on you know yeah. your needs. Yeah. Is there something I haven't covered uh, that you want to talk about? No, I don't think so. Yeah. Uh, well, let me ask this. Uh, you you've been through uh, at least one exit, right? Yeah. Uh, obviously, you're passionate about weights and biases, but uh, I mentioned determined. And I, I know some of their other ML ops companies that, they, that I've talked to, and they end up getting acquired. Is <laughs> are, are are you? How do you feel about this? And there's so much happening, and you are, are, do you have like I'm occupied with this, but what I see this opportunity, and and you know I'd really like to go after that. Well, look, I've never wanted to be a serial entrepreneur. Um, So I really, really hope that this is my last company. I mean, I think through the decisions we make with an eye towards the long term. 
I mean, I've done this long enough now that I know that it's dangerous to say we'll never be acquired. You know, we've, we've raised VC funding and ultimately they will want an exit and the return. But my strong hope is that that comes from an IPO or a way that we can stay um, independent. I think that it's a big enough idea that it should be an independent company. And I care a lot about our ability to integrate with all the different things that our customers are using. So it would be sad if we, I think one of the big benefits of us is, look, we work with your AWS models. We work with your GCP models. If you use Snowflake, we integrate with that. If you use Databricks, we integrate with that. We, we, we work with whatever you're doing. And so I would worry if we were acquired that we might lose that ability yeah. um, to operate independently. AI might be the most important new computer technology ever. It's storming every industry and literally billions of dollars are being invested. So buckle up. The problem is that AI needs a lot of speed and processing power. So how do you compete without costs spiraling out of control? It's time to upgrade to the next generation of the cloud, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, or OCI. OCI is a single platform for your infrastructure, database, application development, and AI needs. OCI has four to eight times the bandwidth of other clouds, offers one consistent price instead of variable regional pricing, and of course, nobody does data better than Oracle. So now you can train your AI models at twice the speed and less than half the cost of other clouds. If you want to do more and spend less, like Uber, 8x8, and Databricks Mosaic, take a free test drive of OCI at oracle.com slash I on AI. That's E-Y-E-O-N-A-I all run together. Oracle.com slash I on AI. That's Oracle.com slash I on AI. That's it for this episode. I want to thank Lucas for his time. If you want to read a transcript of today's conversation, you can find one on our website, I on AI. That's E-Y-E hyphen O-N dot A-I. In the meantime, remember, the singularity may not be near, but AI is changing our world. So pay attention.